क्योंकि वन आर्ट वन फैमिली वन फ्यूचर ऑलरेडी जो इसका एक नारा है या हम कह सकते हैं एक उद्देश्य है इस पे हम जाए और हम देखें तो वाकई में ये बड़ा समावेश इसमें हम देखते हैं कि पूरा विश्व को हम चाहते हैं कि क्योंकि तो हम जो है अपने आप को हैं और मदर ऑफ द डेमोक्रेसी जो है हम हैं तो हम ये चाहते हैं कि जो माँ का रूप होता है क्या वो समावेशी रूप होता है उसी के रूप में जो है हम जी ट्वेंटी को देखें और आज जो है हम देख रहे हैं कि फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी एक बहुत बड़ा कारण है जो हमारे देश को आगे ले जा रहा है आप देखें कि मुझे नहीं याद है कि किसी और देश की आज भी जो गति है वो छह और सात प्रतिशत से जो है हमारी जीडीपी बढ़ रही है तो ये एक बहुत ही गौरव की बात है इस देश के लिए कि हमारी जीडीपी जो है जबकि आप देखें कि यूएस में अभी आपको भी मालूम है बैंक जो था वो डूब गया एक तरह से मर्ज उसको अल्टीमेटली उनको मर्ज करना पड़ा दूसरे बैंक में पर इसका मतलब क्या है कि वहां पर जो है फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी जो है उतनी सदृढ़ नहीं है जितनी की हमारे देश तो ये बड़ा एक सोच का विषय है क्यों हम इतने फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी को मेंटेन कर रहे हैं हमारे यहाँ आप देखिए स्टार्टअप इंडिया मेक इन इंडिया ये छोटी पॉलिसी नहीं है मेक इन इंडिया हम बोले कि कोई बहुत छोटी पॉलिसी है पर इट इज एवं वेरी लॉन्ग इफेक्ट ये सब चीजें जो है हम देख पूरे विश्व को बताना चाह रहे हैं और जहां तक कि क्लाइमेट चेंज की बात करें अभी मोदी जी का जो कार्यक्रम है लाइव करके जो उसके कार्यक्रम है उसमें हम देख रहे हैं कि हमको कैसे जीना है क्लाइमेट के साथ हमको कैसे बर्ताव करना है ये भी बहुत सोच पड़ रहा है इन सब बातों को मुझे लगता है कि आज जो है इस कार्यक्रम में ध्यान दिया जाएगा और मैं इस कार्यक्रम के आयोजकों को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ कि बहुत ही अच्छा कार्यक्रम हमने किया धन्यवाद Thank you so much, sir, for your remarks. Now I request Professor Arvind Kumar from Center for Canadian United States and Latin American Studies, School of International Studies, GNU, for his special lecture. Doctor, honorable. Vice Chancellor of uh, Central City of Jammu, Professor Sanjeev Jain, uh, Dr. Abhishek Chandran, Member State Committee, must be correct, and uh, Dr. Ritu Bakshi, Dean of the Student Affairs, and obviously our today uh, star is here for this one day. Ladies and gentlemen, and I see a lot of distinguished scholars sitting here. Let me at the outset uh, thank the RIS and MEA for organizing this lecture at this Central City of Jammu. And obviously, I also thank Sir Jyoti Jammu for giving this opportunity to me to speak speaking for you. I am very delighted to be a part of this institutional program. I have been visiting a number of universities across the country and trying to really connect with their minds in terms of understanding what they feel about India and rising India. What is it that they really should know about India, which again is one of these tasks given by MEA, particularly in this particular meeting and minds program. So what I will do maybe in the next 30 minutes is to give you a very comprehensive assessment on India's aspiration, India's rising power uh, capabilities, how does the rest of the world view India, and how does India view the world, and also give you some sort of an assessment on the geopolitical aspect of G20, the geostrategic aspect of G20, and the geoeconomics of part of the G20. So this is very important for us to understand. Let me start by saying that when India had become independent. India had taken three major decisions, and these three major decisions obviously reflected India's behavioral pattern, and obviously that shaped India's foreign policy orientation. The first decision which India had undertaken, when the rest of the world, as all of you may be aware, that after the end of the Second World War, a number of new nations had emerged in Asia and Africa, and these new nations were either joining the capitalist bloc or the communist bloc, but India basically chose the path of another alignment. And none ever became a part of India's foreign policy orientation. The second is which was again very important for India, when the rest of the world was either choosing capitalist mode of production or the communist mode of production. India chose the path of socialist part of society with mixed economy. Means India had a closed economy. India was not a part of mainstream global economy. And the third decision again, which again became very important for India, 
when the rest of the country or the whole country was burning, India chose the path of secularism. I think all these aspects of the debate continued for a long time. But at the same time, what was happening at the other part of the world, geopolitically, that the US had emerged as a major superpower. The United States basically wanted to maintain both economic and the political hegemony across the world. And in that context, while the World War II was still continuing, they sat together with the Allied powers and they started discussing about how best they could control the future of the world system, how best they could really be ascendant in the global politics, means how best they could control the global economy. So the Greater Woods Conference was organized by the US, where Greater Woods Conference recommended two institutions. One was International Monetary Fund, and the second was the World Bank. And these two institutions were given certain a specific mandate to see that how best they could stabilize the global economy. But unfortunately, the experience which the world had, that the World Bank kept supporting the maneuvering of the United States, and the international military fund kept supporting the cause of the European country. There was nothing left for the rest of the world. And India, in the meantime, was trying to find a space for itself. And to a larger extent, India did obviously a good job in terms of seeing that how best it could find a respectable place for itself. But its economy was not supporting. A lot of the challenges that were being seen happening at the geopolitical level also were thwarting the larger interests of India. So India again was not really becoming a part of made a stream global politics. India still was, on a, was seen to be a part of fringe player, was not sitting on the main table. All the, the larger agenda were set by those countries which were trying to be seen controlling the global spectrum concerning economy and the quality of the world. But geopolitically, the world was completely changing. And India was trying to find a space for itself, introducing that how best it could really be becoming a responsible player in the world. In the current context, if you see in the last maybe few years or so, the way India has unfolded itself, the way India has really been reflecting its ambitions, I think this particular slogan which really we are discussing and all the white master and uh, our uh, this, uh, <coughs> ESW also made a statement, one earth, one family, one world future. What does that mean? It means that India does not really want to get benefited at the cost of the others. India wants to create a win-win situation. India does not want the way the rest of the world really was doing in terms of really seeing that obviously their interest remains paramount. And India obviously is now working for a global solution in, in respect to all the problems which the world is confronting. So I think this particular presidency which India has achieved has a larger aspiration for India. It's more than aspiration, larger responsibility for India. As was pointed out, the rest of the world is keenly watching India. And expecting from India that how does India could become a part of the solution to the global problem. And that is how the things really are becoming more interesting geoeconomically, geopolitically, and obviously geo in the, in the geostrategic perspective also. The creation of G20 really happened again. I will just give a very brief background under what circumstances G20 came into existence. Because as I said, that IMF and the World Bank were not really working for the whole world. So ultimately, what happened, the rest of the world again was uh, witnessing. A, a financial crisis in the decade of 70s. And these countries, the, these so called the industrialized countries, they started making an exclusive group for themselves in the form of a group of seven. And these seven countries again wanted to be sitting on the main table discussing about the whole world. And that G7 again could not really ascertain the larger pulse of the world. And that really failed in complete uh, terms. And the, by the time the decade of 90s appeared, again there was a financial crisis which happened. So ultimately, the decade of 90s saw the birth of rising economies. Because as you know, that in 1991, India had liberalized its economy. India was showing a consistent sign of, a sign of economic growth. And obviously, other part of the world, in the Asian continent, because if you see the G7 configuration, from the whole Asian continent, there is only one country, Japan, which has been the member of G7. But at the same time, if you see the larger aspects of the Asian continent, the decade of 90s has stayed, there are a number of countries which have the potential to address to the needs of the world system. And in that context, there were many countries which were uh, obviously rising economically and in every part, like Southeast Asia, Indonesia was showing the sign of consistent growth. In North Asia, South Korea was coming up. Then again, if you see the whole of West Asia, Saudi Arabia was coming up. So what happened that the, these G7 countries saw the potential of these members. And that is how the G20 basically became a part of uh, a creation, 
largely in the form of seeing that how the financial tracks stick together among all the 20 countries and obviously decide about the larger interest of the flow. The G20 India was the founding member in 1999 and the way the things got unfolded later on because again the first decade of the century saw again a world economic meltdown and this world economic meltdown was more dangerous for the developed countries than developing countries and as you know that the most of the impact of the world economic meltdown which happened in 2007 was seen impacting the economies of European Union countries. It saw a greater uh, economic recession for the United States. In fact, India was able to survive successfully. In fact, the impact on India from the ongoing world economic meltdown was very less in comparison to the impact which it really witnessed happening across European Union countries, the so-called the fixed group of countries, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. You can imagine the type of challenges which were overcome by the world economy. So when this world government down happened, I think the G20 felt that the time has come that it should get elevated from the finance track, financial minister track, to the track of the leadership summit. In real sense, 2007 was the year which really gave the birth to the leadership level summit in G20 countries. So I think this timing of India and during presidency again is very unique politically because the rest of the world has been confronting a series of problems at every level. It is not that the world basically has been looking for a larger solution to the continued problem. I think India basically is being seen as a part of uh, uh, as a part of the solution because of the fact that India really has been managing for, uh, the geopolitical in geopolitical terms. India's overall uh, uh, the perception about the world system is that how much the world should be considered as one family. And that perhaps is being reflected in G20. The time India assumed the presidency on 1st December last year, I think the very first day only India can, uh, basically made it uh, very clear that how the, the world problem would be seen as a universal problem and there could be solution to all these continuing global problems. So I will just articulate few of these agenda which India might have in the forthcoming September meeting where India certainly will articulate its larger interest not to really promote its own interest but to see that how the global interest is protected. The first and foremost thing I think is very particular, which really is going to be uh, centering among the G20 members as a part of FIFA discussion, is going to be international economic cooperation. And that is something which is lacking in the larger context. And India basically is going to be cited as an example, because as I say, that India has been seen as, uh, as, as a country which survived successfully despite the world economic meltdown. So what were those regulations which India undertook? What were those domestic policies which India really evolved? What were those uh, restructuring or, 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 or the issues which were becoming part of the debate in the economic sphere? How India managed it is going to be shared among the G20 members because this is going to be again helping all the members to see that how there should be a consistency in the growth of the GDP of the respective countries and also contributing meaningfully to the GDP of the global economy. I think that is going to be centering around. The second thing which India will do, that how is India could promote international trade. And as was pointed out, Make in India. Make in India is not obviously is a, just a slogan. I think the way India basically has been concentrating on the Make in India campaign is largely to attract foreign investment. Now you see that how India develops in a manner by which the, the, there is a win-win situation for all. And in that context, the promotion of entrepreneurship and also see that how there should be again infrastructure development which could again attract the rest of the country, the rest of the world to really see how they become a part of the larger benefit which will, which will come in the form of international economic cooperation. So that is going to happen. But as you know that when the country uh, develops economically, there is a direct correlation in terms of your energy requirement. And that perhaps is going to be again featuring prominently during this leadership summit as a part of discussion among G20 countries for the simple reason that climate change is becoming a major issue for the world. Climate change is a universal problem. And in that climate change, all the debates which are centering around, that there should certainly be a way by which the correlation between the economic development and the energy requirement is sustainable. And in that context, I think the idea basically is that how much the country should really be, uh, in fact, having less dependency on the use of the fossil fuel. Because more and more use of the fossil fuel will generate more and more concentration of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And more and more concentration of the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, more and more challenges for the climate change. So that is universal. A good news about India, that whatever India really had uh, uh, made as a part of the Paris Protocol Agreement, because India was the main agenda setter for Paris Protocol Agreement. 
and in that one of these important stipulations made that countries should really be those countries which are part of the Paris Protocol should take this climate change seriously, and their dependency on the use of fossil fuel should decrease lesser than sixty percent. And India has followed that so strictly that by December two thousand twenty-two, India already has uh, been able to achieve that target, and the target was given that it should really be achieved by twenty thirty. So India is ahead, eight years ahead than the other members of the Paris Protocol. And as one is aware that the largest emitter of the greenhouse gas in the world is China, followed by the United States, third is the European Union, and fourth is India. But I think India's case study in terms of how India has done that, in terms of putting more emphasis on the renewables and also the other means of power generation, because that is something which India has to do. And as India has announced, that India could really be able to achieve zero net emission by 2070. And as slowly and steadily, I think India has given a huge timeline. But obviously, India's responsibility would be seen. How does India could obviously become a case study to be understood by the rest of the world in terms of seeing that their dependency on the use of the fossil fuel gets completely reduced, and that is something which is very important. And India is going to be seen as a very important. I think it's going to be a very important landmark for India to be seen among the G20 members in September 20. The third thing, which again I would like to bring here, which is something very important, as you know, the pandemic has really given a new lesson for the world system. Pandemic obviously has impacted the way it was not even envisaged by the developed countries, and developing countries obviously had no means to address the pandemic issue. By the way, let me again define because a lot of this research has come up such a thing here because we keep using the word developed country and developing country, and something which really I would like to really uh, differentiate what is a developed country. Despite the fact that China has now 16 trillion economy, 16 trillion dollar economy, China still is a developing country. The United States is having 22 trillion economy, is a developed country. India is having now 3.5 trillion uh, economy, it is a still developing country. So the developed country is one whose per capita energy consumption is high, and this speaks all about every development, infrastructure development, your health facility. Anything you bring will be will be defined by it. But developing country is one whose per capita energy consumption is low, and that is something which India features in that prominently, despite the fact that it has obviously been reaching actually the target to reach to five trillion economy by 2030. And obviously, the way the things are unfolding, the way GDP is really growing, I think India certainly would be able to achieve that. But in the meantime, the volume of uh, GDP, which again China has, which is 16 trillion, uh, still is a developing country. So now there is a differentiation in this relation. We say we suggest rising economy, emerging economy, and in that quarter, India and China figures into that. So despite the fact that the pandemic could not differentiate between developed countries and developing countries because it had more lethal consequences for the developed world like the United States, they were the I don't know they were not able to manage that. Now this pandemic, the health security debate is becoming very prominent now. But India is uh, seen. Uh, uh, India is being seen emerging in the forefront of all the debate. The way India managed 1.4 billion of its own population, as well as it also really uh, leverages its interest by promoting vaccine diplomacy, and that is something which is going to be very important for India to be seen as a case case in point. How does India could really be able to show some sort of a comprehensive picture in terms of doing work in the area? Where they could really get uh, get, get certain solution to the larger problem, because there are a lot of uh, challenges which are coming up. That a new type of pandemic will again come, and again, how this one can really get prepared for itself. So a lot of these debates are happening. So again, health security again would feature prominently in all these debates, which again uh, is going to be featuring. The fourth thing which I want to say, which India basically has been campaigning for, it is called democratization of technology, and this is something which is very important, as we are aware that most of these technologies. Get originated in the United States. They originate it, but they are not showing any willingness in terms of sharing the technological know-how with the rest of the world. How much India could prevail upon these countries to see that they could be win-win situation for us? As I said, that the whole slogan about one earth, one family, and one future is nothing but India attempting to create win-win situation for the for the for, for the whole world. And in that context, I think this is going to be again very important. The fifth thing that you are uh, aware. India really has been embarking on uh, becoming a complete digital India, and it's not as easy to be seen as a digital India because more and more advances in uh, information, communication, technology, more and more vulnerabilities will come. 
and in that context, how best India would remain invulnerable? Because this ICT advances obviously uh, uh, have made the rest of the world also vulnerable. And there's some sort of, uh, if you ask me that what is going to be the likely future of warfare, the likely nature of warfare is going to be completely on the networks. It's not going to be a physical warfare. Each of the nations would try to destroy each other's network. How India could prepare itself in terms of defending its critical infrastructure. Because critical infrastructure is something very important. Power grid, suppose it gets penetrated by the pace group, or for that matter, any of the state institutions, what will happen to India? The second is banking and finance. As you know, every part of our banking and finance is compromised. And something goes wrong, what could really happen to the future of Indian economy? The third, as you know, we have one of the largest railway network. And that again, uh, just to imagine a case a, a, a scenario that your seat is in, uh, suppose, A2, they have changed to S30. I think, uh, knowing the Indian mindset, people will die in the stampede of the railway system. I think a lot of these, the critical infrastructure again is becoming a part of the debate. And fourth, again, very important critical infrastructure is nuclear command and control. As you know, you are, we are a nuclear control state. Obviously, India could protect the one nuclear system. So again, digital India is a slogan, largest slogan. But it has its own ramifications if India is not prepared. Obviously, India could prepare and work together among the countries which could really help all, all the countries to get benefit from. India really has been pioneer, has been pioneering a number of software technology. If nothing has happened so far today, it means India has been working on that largely to fulfill to accomplish those difficult tasks to remain invulnerable. Because there's something called vulnerability inability paradox. And that is something which India really has taken very seriously. It's going to be debated at length among these G20 members. Because as you know, that the G20 members contribute to the 80% of GDP of the global economy. So I, think, I think that is something which is very important. Because each of the countries which really have been a part of G20, I think it is, it is certainly going to be very important for them. Obviously, they could protect those infrastructure which are again networked, and that is something which India is taking very seriously. The sixth, uh, sorry, the seventh one which I want to say, which India has been campaigning for, that is called women-led development and women's empowerment. And that is something which is uh, which India is again seen, uh, seen as a part of the case study. Because I think I would try to enfranchise to women in the US, the most advanced country was given in 1920. So how the rest of the world can learn from India's experience, and how is India could really be seen uh, at a case in point to see that how the women's empowerment, how India has achieved. The literacy rate in particular, if you compare how the, the, the consistency in India's literacy rate the, in terms of uh, the overall growth, the female literacy and the male literacy, it is really a very tremendous development which has happened in the last few years. And that is something which India has to be putting as a case study for the other members of G20 to learn from. I think India's experience is going to be very important in this G20 uh, experiment. And obviously the timing which really has uh, come for India, where the whole the world is highly complicated, the world has become very complicated, it's not that easy to understand the geopolitics part of it, or the geoeconomics part of it, or the geostrategic part of it. India has been attempting to really bring all these perspectives in a manner by which there could be the largest solution to the global problem. And each of the members of the G20 obviously would be able to get those a strategic advantages which are going to be very collective and obviously work in the unison for the larger interests of the world peace and stability. I think India has been embarking on peace and stability through dialogue and diplomacy. And that is something which we have to understand largely as India's foreign policy orientation. So this G20 platform, which India is going to use, is to project itself. And there's no denying the fact that India's image has got elevated. It is being perceived as a respectable player. It is certainly not being seen as highly intimidating power, the way China is perceived. There was, there was, uh, the, uh, there was a, a survey done among all the Southeast Asian nations, whether uh, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Myanmar, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, all the 10 countries, this survey was done. And all the 10 countries had only one uh, perspective that how is they could really come out from this China's uh, influence because they, they found China to be highly intimidating and they wanted to work more with India. And if you see that uh, more recently, you may have seen uh, uh, Prime Minister had this state Papua New Guinea and how Papua New Guinea really did Prime Minister. Their, their Prime Minister does the feet of the Prime Minister. It came in the whole video. And you see that that is what is called respectable player. India does not want to be seen uh, a player where there is no respect at all. I think India really is working slowly and steadily 
to become a part of the solution to the global problem and how will that could really uh, be achieved through this uh, G20 platform is going to be a major uh, development in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us with the different aspects at geopolitical level, geoeconomic, and geostrategic level vis a vis India's G20 presidency. Now I request Dr. Abhishek Tandanji, Member Steering Committee, G20 University Connect, for his remarks. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sanjeev, Speaker for today, Professor Arvind, Registrar, Professor Yashwan, Dean of Students Welfare and Organizing, Committee Head and Convener of today's program, Dr. Ritu Bakshi, colleagues from RIS, uh, Senior Professors, Faculty Members, Research Scholars and Students. First of all, I am really happy to visit this new campus of Central University of Jammu and as I have been told that in the past 2-3 years a lot of development is happening and very soon a lot of new facilities are going to come up in this new campus. A hearty congratulations to all of you for this. Friends, yeah you can clap please, for your wise answer it is required. Friends, sometime last year, during this particular time only, it was decided that G20 should be taken to all the universities, all the students, and the academic fraternity. We have several parallel tracks of G20, whether it is C20, whether it is Youth 20, whether it is Women 20. But there was no university 20. Only at that time it was decided that something like G20 University Connect should be started. And I am proudly saying this in front of you. This vision was of our Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I attended one of the meeting, meetings where he also said why this has to go to all the students to, of our country. Number one, today we are not only citizens of Jammu or India, we are global citizens. Whatever we do today is going to affect our future generations. We have to act in a way which is not only responsible to our own country but also globally responsible. Number two, all of us should feel proud of this moment that today we are hosting the presidency of G20. And number three, we should be ready to take the best practices that we see from all the participating nations and countries, of course the European Union countries and 19 other countries which are going to offer for our academic fraternity. Professor Arvind has already mentioned a lot about how G20 is relevant for our country and how India is going to play an important role. It's also important to look at the aspect of how India's image globally has increased. As mentioned by my previous speaker, even I was feeling proud when I saw our Prime Minister being received at the G7 summit in Japan. This is not only the way which our Prime Minister is getting received, it is each and every citizen that should feel proud of this reception that our Prime Minister gets. And similarly in Australia, friends, G20 has a lot of issues revolving around geopolitical issues, economic issues, issues now which are related to peace. India is a country which preaches and practices the policy of Mahatma Gandhi, that is peace. 
आज जब रशिया और यूक्रेन आपस में लड़ रहे हैं तो भी भारत से ये अपेक्षा की जाती है कि भारत आकर मध्यस्थता करे और गांधी जी का जो मार्ग है उसके ऊपर लाकर कहीं ना कहीं पीस प्रोसेस की बिल्डिंग की जाए ये एक भारत की अपने आप में एक जो हमारी एक संस्कृति है भारतीय इथोस है उसको रिफ्लेक्ट करता है ग्लोबल इकोनॉमिक क्राइसिस और ग्लोबल इकोनॉमिक प्रॉब्लम्स हैव बीन क्रिएटेड आफ्टर स्पेशली द पैंडमिक एंड नॉट ओनली इंडिया मेजोरिटी ऑफ एज सर से डेवलप्ड इकोनॉमीज आर फेसिंग प्रॉब्लम्स बिग बैंक्स आर शटिंग डाउन बट विथ दी पार्टिसिपेशन इंक्लूसिविटी एंड डेमोक्रेटाइजेशन दैट आर कंट्री फॉलोज I think we are still on the right track. I remember reading Honorable Prime Minister's article on the first of December when India took over as the presidency of G20. What are we going to showcase to the guests that are going to come to our country? The biggest positive that our country has is our democracy. and it is not only at the top level it is there from right at the top till the lowest decision making body in our country even in the university this is one thing which india can embrace and this is one thing which india can showcase to the guests that are going to come throughout the period of one year i met one of the colleagues from one of the panel groups who was attending all the meetings in indonesia and i would like to share what he said he said that i attended three meetings with indonesia's presidency and all the three meetings happened in bali in india you will be happy to know that 200 meetings are happening and only three to four meetings are happening in new delhi this is the kind of democracy this is the kind of participation that is required from the top office and when it comes from the top it definitely goes and percolates down under sathiyo abhi ye kehna mushkil nahi hai ki abhi bharat ka samay hai ho sakta hai is manch se main kahun vc sir kahe arvind sir kahe to aapko is baat ka vishwas na ho परंतु मैं एक रिपोर्ट साइट करना चाहूंगा मॉर्गन स्टैनली की मॉर्गन स्टैनली कोई भारत की संस्था नहीं है मॉर्गन स्टैनली ने कहा है कि द नेक्स्ट टेन इयर्स आर गोइंग टू बिलोंग टू इंडिया एंड द रीजन फॉर दैट दे हैव गिवन फोर डीज प्रोफेसर अरविंद ऑलमोस्ट कवर ऑल कवर ऑल द फोर डीज पर मैं फोर डीज जरूर बता देता हूँ आपको सबसे पहला डी डेमोग्राफिक कंडीशन हम लोग एक युवा देश है भारत की जो मीन एज है वो 27 है मीडियन एज है 27 है आज हमारे पास वो शक्ति है कि हमारे पास जो ज्यादातर वर्किंग पॉपुलेशन है वो युवा है दैट्स व्हाई डेमोग्राफिकली वी आर एट अ वेरी सॉलिड पॉइंट नेक्स्ट इज डीकार्बनाइजेशन एज सर मेंशन वी आर ऑलरेडी अचीविंग एंड ट्राइंग टू अचीव दैट हमारे जो एमिशन है वो कम से कम हो और डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज जो सो कॉल्ड है उनके पास ऐसी कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं थी कोई ऐसी इश्यूज नहीं थे जब वो डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज से डेवलप की तरफ जा रहे थे पर हमारे पास वो इश्यूज हैं। फिर भी वी आर ट्राइंग टू मेक श्योर कि हम एनवायरनमेंट के साथ चलें। नंबर थ्री डिजिटलाइजेशन 87 परसेंट ऑफ द पॉपुलेशन ऑफ आर कंट्री इज नाउ बीन कवर्ड बाई डिजिटलाइजेशन आप बाहर जाते हैं कुलचे छोले की शॉप पे भी आपको पेटीएम का या फोन पे का एक स्कैन करने का ऑप्शन मिलता है दैट इज द पावर ऑफ आर कंट्री इस देश में लोगों ने कहा था कि ये डिजिटलाइजेशन आएगा तो गांव में कैसे आएगा पर आज आप देखिए 87% ऑफ ऑफ द पीपल दिस कंट्री आर अंडर कवरेज ऑफ डिजिटलाइजेशन डिजिटलाइजेशन की वजह से देश में एक बड़ी लड़ाई हुई है भ्रष्टाचार के खिलाफ और ये भ्रष्टाचार के खिलाफ जो लड़ाई है इसको भी आगे बढ़ाना है और इसी वजह से मॉर्गन स्टैनली की रिपोर्ट में इसका मेंशन किया गया तो ऐसी तीन डीज के बारे में मैंने बात किया डिकार्बनाइजेशन डिजिटलाइजेशन और डेमोग्राफी 
एक और डी की बात आजकल हो रही है डी ग्लोबलाइजेशन उसमें भी भारत ने आत्मनिर्भरता की बात करी है परंतु आत्मनिर्भरता की बात ऐसे नहीं है कि भारत जब भी विकास की बात सोचता है तो अपने ही नहीं केवल परंतु विश्व के विकास की बात सोचता है आई वुड ऑल्सो लाइक टू मैं इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग अंडर द इंडिया जी ट्वेंटी प्रेजिडेंसी प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ इंडिया स्टार्टेड अ सेपरेट फोकस ग्रुप ऑन स्टार्टअप ट्वेंटी देश भर के सभी जितनी भी कंट्रीज हैं भारत के साथ मिलकर स्टार्टअप की एक नई दिशा तय करेंगे हमने जो स्टार्टअप ने किया है हमारा थर्ड हम नंबर वर्ल्ड में थर्ड है स्टार्टअप इकोसिस्टम में सौ से ज्यादा यूनिकॉर्न है हमारे हमारे पास जो है हम सबके साथ शेयर करेंगे और बाकी लोगों के पास जो है वो उनसे सीखेंगे अभी गोवा में थर्ड और फोर्थ जून को स्टार्टअप ट्वेंटी की मीटिंग होने जा रही है तो भारत जब विकास की बात करता है तो स्वयं के नहीं बल्कि सबके विकास की बात करता है वसुदेव कुटुंबकम की बात हमने सबने सुनी है परंतु ये भी जानना जरूरी है कि वसुदेव कुटुंबकम की बात भारत ने आज नहीं करी भारत ने 50 साल पहले नहीं करी भारत ने वसुदेव कुटुंबकम की बात तब करी जब भारत विश्व गुरु था हजारों साल पहले जब भारत सोने की चिड़िया कहलाया जाता था शायद तब वसुदेव कुटुंबकम की बात ना करने से भी कोई उसका फायदा या नुकसान नहीं था आज बड़े बड़े देश जो अपने आप को डेवलप कहते हैं उन्होंने हमें अपने देश में सबसे पहले वैक्सीन लगाई परंतु वैक्सीन मैत्री के नाते भारत ने डेढ़ सौ से ज्यादा देशों को वैक्सीन दी तो ऐसे सभी जो इनिशिएटिव्स हैं जो हमारी कंट्री ने लिए हैं आई एम श्योर की इंडिया इज गोइंग टू रेज ऑल दीज इशूज एट दोप्रिएट लेवल ऑफ हेड्स ऑफ स्टेट मीटिंग in the times to come and uh, with the limited time i have i would have to wrap up once again thank you very much for having me here thank you thank you so much sir for your valuable insights on india's values and its stand around india's g20 presidency now the house is open for question answer session Anyone is having any query in mind? The house is open. Please hand over the mic, sir. Sir, actually, my question is for you. I talked to doctors from the Department of Environmental Science. So, after your demography, your chart, did you have any questions? So, first, the जो रिपोर्ट आप कह रहे थे डेमोग्राफी में हम लकी हैं बट वो पंद्रह साल बड़े क्रूशियल है भारत के लिए क्योंकि जो एक सौ बयालीस करोड़ की आबादी है वो अभी स्किल्ड नहीं है हमारे अगर इन पंद्रह सालों में हमने उस डेमोग्राफी डिविडेंट को यूज किया तब तो हम निश्चित रूप से डेवलप बन पाएंगे अदरवाइज जो बड़ा चैलेंज एक अपॉर्चुनिटी तो है भारत के पास बट एक बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है कि अपने यूथ का स्किल और उसकी पूरी एनर्जी हम यूज कर तभी उसको हम यूज कर पाएंगे तो ये मेरा सुझाव बिकॉज आई एम थिंकिंग ऑन दैट पार्ट बिकॉज ये बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है ये साथ सेकंड पॉइंट सर मिशन लाइफ पर पढ़ता हूं मैं क्लास में पढ़ाता हूं कि हम भारत में जो बात करते हैं लाइफस्टाइल और इन्वायरमेंट की हम हमेशा अपने आप को प्रकृति से जोड़ने की बात करता है भारत और डेवलप्ड नेशन जैसा अभी सर से मैंने सुना कि जो देश जितना ज्यादा इंडस्ट्रियलाइज है जितना ज्यादा कार्बन इमिशन कर रहा है वो डेवलप्ड कहला रहा है और हम हमेशा से बात करते हैं कि हमने पर्यावरण के साथ रहना है तो एक विश्व को मैसेज जाना चाहिए कि जो देश पर्यावरण के साथ बढ़ते हुए बैलेंस इकोनॉमी लेके चलेगा उसको लीडरशिप मिलना चाहिए क्योंकि अगर हम भी पोल्यूशन करेंगे क्योंकि पर कैपिटल इनकम या इंडस्ट्रियलाइजेशन की आप बात करें तो उसमें तो भारत के लिए चैलेंज होगा की डेवलप अगर हमने बनना है तो हमने भी डेवलपमेंट करना कार्बन एमिशन करना फिर हम मिशन लाइफ की भी बात करते हैं पैरली So there is a debate which need to be discussed at a length. What I think is that just a suggestion here to get as a input from you. Thank you. Yeah, I think your uh, second question I would like to address. I think very important question you have raised. See what is happening in the current context. The day is a demand made by India with the Country is actually having a meeting mode. How best they could reduce the dependency of uh, fossil fuel in their energy-saving constituents? 
And India has shown that look, they could do, India can do it. Because India, as I was also telling about the Paris Protocol Agreement, where there was a stipulation made that uh, by 2030, the nation states really needed to get completely reduced the use of the fossil fuel less than 60%, which India already has done in December 2022. So slowly, actually, what is happening now? India is taking lead at the global level. You may be knowing about the formation of International Solar Alliance, which again India had taken the lead, and uh, that is something which is showing again a very important development in terms of uh, seeing the whole rest of the globe. If the developed countries support, how well they can really become net zero emission world? I think net zero emission world is very important for protecting the environment. If we are not having the net zero emission world, then obviously we'll have a lot of challenges which could again be very difficult. I didn't cover a lot of things with regard to the food security, because that is also is going to be a part of the agenda for India to discuss. Because as you know that India is now having surplus food production, where the rest of the world is having problem with the food. Just you can imagine India in 1950s and India in this uh, third decade of this century, how India has changed and transformed. 80 crore of Indians are given free meals. It's not only one day, two day, for the last two and a half years, India has been providing. We can imagine India's resilience and India's overall capability. So I think the rest of the world is eyeing on India that with such a huge population, India has been managing so well. India has been moving to a direction where it has the ability to mobilize the international public opinion in favor of changing the energy constituents. When I say energy constituents, or energy security, where every nation, as, as was pointed out very well, that the United States itself has everything in plenty. But they still use fossil fuel for power generation. And that is how the whole imbalance in terms of carbon, carbon emission happens. They have everything. They have plenty of uranium. They can obviously uh, use that uranium for power generation. They have the overall uh, capabilities in the field of wind, solar, everything there. But they are still their energy, if you see the basket, basket, 62% of their energy still comes from the fossil fuel. India is now lower. India is now 60%. Five years ago, India's overall energy production coming from the fossil fuel was 69%. So you can imagine slowly and steadily India has been slowing the path to the world. And it will take its own course. India certainly doesn't want to be seen as a developed country. India all the time has been working to be seen as a responsible country. And how best India's voices could be well heard. And how best India could set the goal for the world. Very nicely pointed out again by Abhisekji that how India really works for the rest of the world. India does not work for itself. We will situation. How it is, has been created. But very good question you have Thank you. Thank you. On the first bit, uh, I think your uh, worry is absolutely right. And not only our own education department, but also several other uh, ministries, whether it is skill ministry, of course, education, national education policy's aim is that uh, students should have skills. Too much priority and too much importance was given to degrees and marks prior to this. But this time, especially in the national education policy, priority has shifted from marks and degrees to skill and value added courses. And I think when all of us collectively together start to feel that this is the problem which needs to be addressed, going forward, we are going to not only have the problem of having a large youth which are going to be unskilled, but also another problem is that in next 20, 25, 30 years, a huge population is going to be old. So a lot of problems are there, but if we address it on the right at the right time, and with the right spirit, I think we are going to get dividend from it and it's never going to be a liability. Any questions? Sasan, Lok Nitya and Lok Prashat Mubar. First of all, I would like to thank the two Pramukh Vakta today. I would like to thank you for coming to our beach. I would like to thank you for coming to our beach. I would like to thank you for coming to our beach. I would like to thank you for coming to our beach. My question was that developed country और विश्व गुरु ये जो दो संकल्पना है क्या ये दो समान संकल्पना है और अगर समान है या उसमें अंतर है तो वो क्या है और उसमें जो अभी हम 1 दिसंबर 2022 से अभी तक हम जो यू की अध्यक्षता कर रहे हैं इसकी भूमिका किस प्रकार से रह सकती है धन्यवाद
India's aspiration to be seen as the Vishnu Guru, I think, is not coming from India. The rest of the world really has been trying to understand India in that direction. That India has all the, uh, the capabilities to assume the responsibility to lead the world affairs. Question: India doesn't want to become a great power. Question: That if India keeps claiming that India is a great power, that will not be acceptable. The best part about the the recent debates, especially in international relations, happening, that is conveying a message that the rest of the world wants India to assume the responsibility. And that is something which the Guru really, the role of this Guru comes into that. And the second thing which again uh, is very important with regard to developed country. See, developed country, I think, uh, to become a developed country for India, as I said, the definition that the per capita energy consumption has to be high. We are still are at the lowest bracket. That is how we are called, uh, we are calling ourselves as emerging economies. So there are a lot of differences between the developed country and the Bisu Guru. Bisu Guru means that how India's voices could be well heard. How India can be a part of agenda setting. How India can sit on the main table, not on the fringe of the table. So I think a lot of these developments which are happening, the very fact that India was invited for G7 summit in Hiroshima, itself conveys a message or is a testimony that India is moving ahead in terms of getting accepted by the rest of the world as a Bishu Guru. And India doesn't want to claim itself all of its own as a Bishu Guru. If India claims, no will take uh, uh, seriously. I think that is how the things are really unfolding. And most of these debates which really are getting unfolded are getting originated from elsewhere in the world. It's not originating in India. We are not having, we have so many universities. I don't think that we have had a debate that whether India is a Bishu Guru or not. This Bishu Guru debate is originating uh, elsewhere in the world. We are, as an academician, trying to understand what is the message which is being conveyed to India. I think India is right now in a position to assume the leadership of the world as a responsible player, as a player which can set the agenda for the international system, as a player which can obviously show a path to the world where there could be a win-win situation. And that is what India is moving ahead. Thank you very much. My experience has been that the first yeah, question, yeah. question, then we'll have a number of questions coming. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you for your enlightening uh, session. Uh, thanks to both of you, sir. So my question is that when you mentioned that uh, we can exemplify to the world regarding women empowerment and women leadership, so how do you think that uh, in the times to come, India is going to take up the reservation of women in, in the parliament because uh, it is still a hurdle? And if we really want to show to the world that uh, equality is something that we value, so this is something we should also give importance to. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shweta Kodi from the Department of Economics. First of all, uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and for the insights into the issues what we are facing today. So my worry of concern, which uh, she has also asked about the women. So you talk about women situation and also you talk about uh, literacy of women. No doubt we are working on it and we have achieved certain targets as well. But my worry is if you talk about the female labor force participation rate in India, even if you compare the female labor force participation rate in South Asia, among the South Asian countries also, if you compare the female labor force participation rate uh, in comparison to Bangladesh, Bhutan, and even in Sri Lanka, they are having high percentage in comparison to what we have. So, what do you think that what constraints uh, are there and what limitations do we have and what challenges are there in front of us so that we can address this? When I was uh, making this uh, in my lecture, I was obviously hoping that these questions will come and I was preparing myself how to answer those questions. And obviously, uh, I think very important questions are there. See, this whole idea of having reservations uh, in parliament, again, is a larger political issue. Let us not go into that debate. Question is that even if you take, for example, the literacy rate since 1947 as of now, and last one decade in particular, the type of, uh, uh, I don't know, changes which have occurred in the Indian society largely in terms of seeing that how the women's empowerment really is becoming visible. And that is how, in fact, the rest of the world, if you take the G20 uh, members, I don't think that if you see the G7 countries, Italy basically had not been able to understand the larger social condition of themselves. The second, again, important country, I'm talking about, I'm talking about G7, uh, Germany. 
they also had failed in terms of addressing to the social uh, causes. France completely. And if you go by the larger patterns of the United States, which is again leader of G7, US really gave the right to franchise to the women in 1920. 1776, they, were, they became independent. You can see that how many years they took. Then again, if you take other countries like United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan, this, these are the G7 configuration. So I think you will find a lot of these changes which really have occurred in those uh, region also. But there are a lot of things to learn from India. Despite all the adversity, how India really has been addressing that and managing all the contradictions is what is being, uh, what, what is going to be discussed in the G20. That is how, in fact, Prime Minister has made it very categorical that how this one can leverage women's empowerment. I think there's a clause which they have put, women-led development and women's empowerment. And that is something which, again, going to be, uh, you know, obviously, you have to really validate with the data that what is it that we have done, how much the other members of G20, as you know, across South Asia, India is the only member of G20. Bhutan is not a member of G20. Pakistan certainly is not. Sri Lanka certainly is not. Bangladesh is not. Nepal is not. So you have seven countries in South Asia. Only India is a member. So that is how, in fact, India will be standing for itself in terms of providing a data which would suggest to the members of G20 in what ways they can learn from India. We have a long mile to, mile to go and we have a number of things to achieve. We are not discussing about that India has done this, India. We are trying to see that how much through those experiences, whether it is good or bad, how the members of G20 will learn from you. This is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you so much for the queries. Uh, I would like now. Okay, thank you. Sir, I got the role that uh, India will become Vishnu Guru. But sir, role clarity, mujhe abhi samajh nahi aayi is mein. Hum jaise students ka kya role rahega, ya hum citizens ka kya role rahega India ko Vishnu Guru banane mein. Second thing is that, sir, we are looking at 2017 in the democratization of the war, the 4Ds. So, in 2017, in Jumad Kashmir, the democracy, the state legislative assembly is not functional. What is the policy of India now to do this for restoration? There is a very big point of view. इंडिया की क्या पॉलिसी किसी भी स्टेट के लिए है ना हम डिस्कस कर रहे हैं। We are talking about the role of India for G20. लोग अपने में पॉइंट। पास तक इस वेरी चीज़ है। ओके नाम इतना। ओके आई मूव ऑन विद द स्केड्यूल प्रोग्राम। डियर ऑडियंस। ओके ओके फाइन सर। सी सर ने इससे पहले भी एक बात बोली कि हमें अपने आप को विश्व गुरु विश्व गुरु नहीं बताना इस विषय में हम चर्चा जरूर कर सकते हैं कि हम विश्व गुरु क्यों थे और कहा जाना है पर बाहर जाकर ये देश और देश ये बात बोले कि भारत विश्व गुरु है अब उसका एक छोटा सा उदाहरण आपको बताता हूं इंडिया ने प्रपोज किया यूनाइटेड नेशंस में कि योगा डे होना चाहिए एक मेजोरिटी ने यूनानिमसली उसे पास किया योग आयुर्वेदा ये सब किसने दिया ये भारत की परंपरा से आई हुई चीजें हैं भारत के अगर आप अपने आ, हिस्ट्री के यहाँ स्टूडेंट्स होंगे तो जब ब्रिटिशर्स वापस गए तो उन्होंने छोटे छोटे नोट्स लिखते थे वो अपनी कॉलोनियल्स के बारे में कि हमारी इस कंट्री के बारे में क्या अनुभव थे इस कंट्री के बारे में क्या अनुभव थे तो नाइनटीन हंड्रेड एंड सॉरी सेवेंटीन हंड्रेड के छोटे छोटे नोट्स में उन्होंने कहा कि जो सबसे अजीब बात देखी उन्होंने भारतीयों के बारे में कि वो पेड़ों की पूजा करते थे अब आज 300 साल बाद क्या करना पड़ रहा है वही सब करना पड़ रहा है जो 300 साल पहले हम करते थे जब कोई व्यक्ति पेड़ों की पूजा करता था तो फिर वो उसको काटेगा नहीं तो इसलिए क्या था कि वो एक जो भारतीय इथोस है वो विश्व गुरु बनाता है हमें भारत की जो कल्चर है उसके अंदर डेमोक्रेसी है एक दूसरे के प्रति टॉलरेंस रखना ये सच्ची डेमोक्रेसी है कोई विशेष परिस्थिति कहीं की हो सकती है और उस परिस्थिति के बारे में वीसी सर ने पहले ही बताया कि वो यहाँ पे शायद चर्चा नहीं करना चाहेंगे परंतु डेमोक्रेसी हमारे ब्लड में है एक जो 
भावना है एक दूसरे के प्रति वो जो है वो हमारी असली डेमोक्रेसी है एक दूसरे के विचारों को सुनना एक दूसरे के विचारों के प्रति रिस्पेक्ट रखना एक दूसरे के विचारों से सहमत ना होते भी साथ रहना ये है असली डेमोक्रेसी सिंपल वे your first question the role of younger generation i think role of younger generation remains vital all of you have to get prepared to articulate india's interest in almost all the forums how best you can you are a student here you are a research scholar here how best you can prepare yourself where you can articulate india's interest in a very constructive manner that is the first role which uh, there only india will become this group otherwise india will never become this group the whole uh, idea of india becoming a this group lies with how best we can really make our younger generation more confident that is first thing second thing question which you have raised is the fact that question has no relevance for this meeting but i am just address to you i think india is looking for some sort of stability domestically and once that stability is achieved obviously there will be a lazy assembly i think anything which should change requires some time and timeline and that is what india is waiting for it's not that it will be a continuing phenomenon obviously there will be a lazy assembly installed very soon so much uh, with the permission i move on with the program dear audience since 1st december 2022 that is the date when india got the presidency of g20 the central university of jammu has been organizing many activities students have been happily engaged in many activities of g20 covering major priority themes related to civil 20 science 20 women 20 and youth 20 the science 20 and women 20 are being organized under mission life that is lifestyle for environment coordinated by dr shweta yadav now i request the dignitaries for the release of the compilation of the activities organized by the central university of jammu under the g20 
announcing the name so that they come forward. Okay, sir. So thank you so much for Rohit Bhardwaj. For Rohit Bhardwaj. Vishal from mathematics. Siddharth Mahajan from PPPA. I'm calling upon the names. Please come forward so that uh, we we may adjust the timing. Aditya Pratap Singh from BWOC. P. Rashid Hussain from PPPA. Diksha Bhagal from Botany. Aditya Nangi from NSS. Rashid Hussain from PPPA. Diksha Bhagal. Abhikya Lange from NSS. This, this certificate is for her participation in civil work. Besides this, we have around 60 such certificates. But as you know that from tomorrow, our vacations are uh, being commenced. So students are not right now present here. And in order to adjust the timing, I request the students, the friends who are sitting here, may convey to them or we may announce it in the WhatsApp group that they may collect their certificates from the DSW office. Now, we take the honor to present mementos to our guests. May I request Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir to present memento to Professor Arvind Kumar. Now I request our registrar, sir, to present memento to Dr. Abhishek Tandar. Again, uh, I request our registrar, sir, to present memento to Mr. Arpit Burman. <laughs> Now I again need to request Professor Yeshwan Sir, Registrar CUJ, for his vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sanjeev Jain Sir, respected Professor Arvind Kumar Sir, special invite. Esteemed Dr. Abhishek Tandon, Member Steering Committee, University Connect. Most valued Dr. Ritu Bakshi, DSW, Dean School of various uh, schools, Head of the various departments, faculty members, officers, staff members, scholars, and dear students. Very good, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I stand here today filled with gratitude as we conclude this remarkable event, the G20 University Connect, engaging young minds. On behalf of the Central University of Jammu, I extend a heartfelt vote of thanks to all the distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, enthusiastic participants, and our tireless team for making this event a resulting success. We are honored to have had the opportunity to bring together the brilliant young minds from across the departments of Central University of Jammu, <coughs> fostering collaboration, dialogue, knowledge sharing. This platform has been instrumental in shaping this shaping the future leaders who will navigate the challenges of world. This is today. 
India is celebrating the presidency of G20 first time. First and foremost, we express our sincere gratitude to the G20 members countries for their support and commitment to the education, innovation, and youth empowerment. As you know, the third G20 tourism working group meeting just concluded in Srinagar. Their vision had laid the foundation for this unique initiative, enabling us to facilitate cross-cultural understanding and exchange of ideas. Our esteemed speakers, Professor Arvind Kumar, Dr. Abhishek Tandon has played a pivotal role in making this event truly exceptional. We extend our deepest appreciation to each one of them for their insightful contribution, thought-provoking lectures, and invaluable expertise. Their diverse perspective have enriched our understanding of global issues and inspired us to think critically, aiming for positive change. To all the participants, we commend you for your enthusiasm, dedication, and active participation throughout this event, your passion for learning, your eagerness to engage with your peers, and your commitment to making a difference in the world are truly inspiring. It is through your collective effort that we can pave the way for a brighter future. We would also like to express our gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, for unwavering support, encouragement to organize such event in the university. With the support of our Honorable Vice Chancellor, we have created an environment that nurtures innovations, fosters creativity, and encourages the pursuit of knowledge. Behind the scene, our organizing committee and volunteers have worked tirelessly to ensure the seamless execution of this event. Their dedication, meticulous planning, and the attention to detail have been crucial in creating an exceptional experience for everyone involved. We owe them a debt of gratitude for their unwavering commitment and hard work. Last but not least, we would like to express our heartfelt thanks to the sponsors, media persons, supporters who have generously contributed their resources, time, and expertise to make this event possible. Your commitment to empowering next generation of leaders is commendable, and we are immensely grateful for your support. As we bring this event to close, let us remember that the impact of G20 University Connect will extend far beyond these few days. The knowledge gained, the connection forged, and the experience shared will continue to shape our lives and the world we live in. Once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, I extend my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you, your presence, engagement, and contributions have made this event a resounding success. Let us carry forward the spirit of collaboration, innovation, and youth empowerment, striving to create a better future for all. Thank you. Jai Hind.
की Kindly join us all for high tea for the guest deans and heads in the committee room, for the faculty in the reading room, and for students in the boiler room.